So next thing I want to do is I want to talk about this thing that's called the substitution model for, for procedure evaluation. And um, this is a simplified way of looking at how the scheme interpreter works. Um, it, it, it's, um, it's very effective at understanding how expressions evaluate and also reasoning about their time and space performance. Um, so in reality, the compiler the interpreter doesn't do it this way, but this is um, a, a, an accessible model that's very accurate. So it, we're going to learn it. It's worth learning. Um, so what I want to do is, is walk through an example of how to do that. Um, all right, so first let me give the definition of what the substitution model is. So this is from the book. OK, so here's the substitution model. To apply a compound procedure to arguments, evaluate the body of the procedure with each formal parameter replaced by the corresponding argument. What's a compound procedure? So that's a synonym for user procedure. So that's something that we made. So let's give an example. Let's say we have our square procedure. I'm just going to call it SQ to be safe writing times NN. All right, wait, make sure there's a space there. All right, so now we type SQ of 5. So what happens? So we enter, um, we, we make, uh, we, we evaluate the body with each formal parameter replaced by its corresponding argument. So we're going to rewrite this. Ex it's, think of this as like expression rewriting. So we're going to rewrite the square expression with the body of the procedure and with the ends replaced by the actual parameter. So we. We imagine that the interpreter says, OK, SQ5 is equal to that expression. And then we evaluate that expression, and it produces the result. Oh, sorry. So let's say there's a slightly more complicated um, example. We're going to define a procedure called sum of squares. And it will have a parameter x and y. And that procedure will use our square procedure. So it will be the sum of squaring x and squaring y. That's the sum of squares. OK, so let's say that procedure exists. And now we're going to make some silly procedure called f. And this will just take one parameter, which we're going to call a. And what that's going to do is it's going to, to call sum of squares on a plus 1 and a plus 2. So maybe there's a good reason why like f exists. There's some math problem where that's interesting, and we want to do that. All right. So what happens if we then say f of 3? All right. So I think we've got, yeah. You've got square in your head. You don't need to see that one right now. So. Yeah, what happens if we, um, if we need to evaluate f of 3 using the substitution model? All right, so we're just going to do this rewrite rules. We look at the body of f and replace a with 3. So that's going to be sum of squares of plus a is now a 3. 3, 1, plus 3, 2. 
Okay, so well now we can we can actually do these evaluations. We don't need to um, do any like um, procedure application. So that becomes sum of squares of four and five. Now we go and and do sum of squares. So what sum of squares is still up there? Okay, so that gets rewritten as, let me zoom out a little so that we can see it all. Okay, so that's going to get rewritten as some, the body of sum of squares. So plus of square, and what's x? Yeah, x is going to be bound to 4, and y is going to be bound to 5. This is tedious, but like, it's, it's actually a functional model. This will work. Functional in the sense of it gets the job done. All right, so now square of 4, now I have to go all the way back to the definition of square, but we all have that in our head. So that's times 4, 4. And that's going to be times 5, 5. And now we can do plus 16 and 25. And so now it's done with 41. Okay, so that's the substitution model. Um, now let's, let's do it on a more interesting example. So I'm going to hand out um, this worksheet where you guys can do it on, um, on factorial. And we're going to have two different, we're going to have two different definitions of factorial. Um, so let's do this page first. I'm going to start them over here. As it's going around, let's just talk through question one. And so I put the formal definition at the top of the page. That's what we're just looking at. And it defines this, it uses this term compound procedure. What do we say that is? User. Yeah, that's a user procedure. And if it's not a user procedure, well, then what is it? What's the name for that? I, I think I use the term built in. But there's another term that's like actually preferred. <coughs> operator is close. Operator assumes it's like a plus or something like that, and this is a more general thing. An operator would be an example. So evaluator is like the entire system. Okay, so the the word is primitive. That's the word that the scheme community adopted for a built-in thing, and it might be an operator. That's a subset of, op like, some things aren't operators, but they're still procedures. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, let me pick them up, yeah. Sorry. All right, so why don't you guys work on this question two thing and talk to each other, and then we'll go over it. Can I, just, can I just go over this first line here, or the two lines? Sorry, we're, I told you to start with factorial 4, so let's write that down. 
So now, oh, oh, wait a minute. I just like, I just like glided over the fact that there's an if statement here. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. We'll glide over that by, we know that 4, that n is 4, so it's not 1. So we're just going to interpret the if statement ourselves and then rewrite the result of the if statement. And then you can go from there. So let me, um, let me do this with you guys. So I saw pretty much each person I spoke with had a different thing, and that's to be expected. Um, one thing to keep in mind is you're not trying to like get the answer here. You're trying to like, this is like middle school math where like, I mean I've seen my kids go through math where they verbosely write out these algorithms when they know the answer, right? So this is the verbose, like, you know, it's annoying, but it has a pedagogical point. So you're not trying to just find out what the answer is. You're trying to show the process. OK. So we're, and we're doing it, think about it as these like rewrite rules. So 
here we start with factorial 4. We rewrote it by taking the body. We allowed ourselves the liberty of, of evaluating the if. So we just said, OK, n isn't 1, so we're going to, um, we're going to rewrite this with the binding for n. And that's how I got this statement. Now, what's the next step here? We can evaluate this. This one, we know the answer. We don't need to, like, um, there's nothing to substitute. We can, so we're going to, I'm just going to rewrite it with the answer in place. Right? We can do minus 4, 1 and get a 3. So now, this is the expression we need to rewrite. And so we have to do the same deal again for factorial 3. Um, we don't know what that is yet, so we still have to leave this multiplication hanging. So it's still times 4, and now we do the same step from the beginning and rewrite it with this expression. So that's going to be times 3 of factorial. Now I'm going to take the liberty again. It's going to be minus 3, 1, which is a 2. So we're going to do a little bit of brevity. So now we've got this, right? Is everyone on board so far? All right, I didn't hear anything, but I'm going to assume that's a yes. All right, what's factorial of 2? It's times 2 of factorial 1. Yes? What's factorial 1? That one, we're going to, the first part of the if is going to fire. And that, that gets rewritten as 1. Factorial, factorial of 1 becomes a 1. Um, I've got three parents. OK, now we can start doing some multiplications. The only multiplication we can do at the next stage is this times 2, 1. We can't do this times 3 of something. Well, if we try to evaluate this expression, what would happen? We'd, we'd evaluate the times and get the procedure for multiplying. We'd evaluate the 3 and get a 3. And then we'd have to evaluate this expression, which is times 2, 1. So we'd recursively have to figure out what times 2, 1 is before this multiply could happen. So it's the same story here. So to unwind it, we actually have to do it one step at a time. And this is, this is more or less what actually happens. There we go. Look, it perfectly fits on the page. So that's what happens. That's the substitution model at work for factorial. Um, OK, let's talk complexity in um, space and time. Where, which courses do you guys do where we formally deal with complexity? Is that algorithms? OK, but in data structures, which is computing too, you were introduced to complexity. Is that right? Space and time performance of different data. And discrete. All right, great. So this is not the first time. No? OK. OK. Depends on the instructor. OK. Well, you're going to get it in spades and algorithms, which presumably you haven't taken yet. I mean, maybe you have, but nominally you haven't. But you've been introduced to it in, in, data, stru in data structures. And this, in this class, you only need the basic ideas. So let's look at this in terms of um, time. What's the complexity of how many steps there are as a function of n in terms of time? It's kind of like 2 times the number 2n, right? Which boils down to order n. The, the like, constant goes away. So the time, the number of steps, time is like the number of steps. It's order of n. It's, it's proportional to n. If we have twice as many, if n gets twice as big, there's twice as many steps in times 2, order n. OK? What about for space? How, like, one way to think about space in this case is how long is the expression in the worst case? Yeah. Yeah, it's also order n. We can think about it. There's all these are, all these multiplies are pending operations that require space. If it, if it were literal, you could build a system that did this with the rewrites, like it produced these rewritten expressions. You could build an interpreter that way, and it would actually pretty much do the same thing. It wouldn't be efficient. 
Um, but it would still be, you've got all these pending multiplies, and it's order n. If n gets to be 10, there's going to be 9 multiplications. If n is 20, there's 19 of them. So space is also order n. Any questions on this? All right, flip the page. Now, we have a different way of doing factorial. And it uses a, what's, um, what we're going to call a helper procedure. So this, um, this fact iter, the iter is, um, is short for iter iteration, which is a clue as to what's going to be happening. Um, and then it's a helper procedure because the user would call, would, would you, you have, you're writing factorial for your software library. You're providing factorial. And um, later we'll see that we can define this fact iter procedure inside the scope of factorial. Right now they're both at the global level, so like fact iter is accessible to the user. But the idea is the user would never touch fact iter. The user would just use factorial. And you can see factorial uses the iter, the fact iter. So this is a, in the category of a helper procedure. OK, so do the same thing with this. And let's see what happens. And do factorial of 4, what happens? And you're allowed to interpret the if, just like we did before.
How are you? Okay, so this is, uh, I asked to put Tim's up on the board here, on the screen. So this is pretty much the story of what happens. Um, right, so the factorial 4 gets immediately rewritten as a call to fact iter with 1, 1, and 4. And then the, the, the cool thing is that at each stage, fact iter is, is just calling itself with a new set of parameters. So you know, product was 1, counter is 1, max count is 4, and that results in the, this math. And when you, when you do the substitutions, it calls itself with 1, 2, and 4. And then the next time it calls itself with 2, 3, and 4. And the next time it calls itself with 6, 4, and 4. And then the last time it calls itself with 25, 5, and 4, at which point the 5 becomes greater than the 4, and it just returns the answer of 24. So at each stage, it's like feeding itself a new set of loop variables. That's effectively what's going on. Tim, I'm going to write on your... These, these three parameters, in the case of an iterative recursion, are like count, loop counter variables. Yep, thank you. Um, so effectively, all we've done is build a loop. And then at some point, the loop terminates, and we're done. We return the answer. So the really cool thing here is this is order 1 in space. It's still order n in time. There's still, like, however big the argument are, you still have to recycle the loop that many times. But it's order 1 in, in space because we didn't have to have this chain of deferred multiplies. We do the multiply at each step, hand that into the, the next call. Um, and so th this, this fact, it or procedure, is written in a style that is known in the scheme world as using what's called tail recursion. And tail recursion happens, there it is, when the, when the last thing that the procedure does is call itself, and there's no pending operations. It's not like multiplying something by the result of calling itself. It's directly calling itself. It's a compiler optimization that's built in. It's a part of the spec of the scheme language is it must implement tail recursion. And what it allows you to do is to write things in the... Rec so recursive simply means referring to yourself, self-referential. So you can refer to yourself um, in the definition, but you still are building a loop. So that was the uh, clue of this being called an iterative procedure. So iteration means loop. That's what it, and the and so to like close, both of these, the question two and three are both recursive definitions in that they, they're defined in terms of themselves, but one produced a recursive process. That was the one on the first page. And then this one produced an iterative process. So pretty much this is a big part of what we're doing this week, is looking at how to define procedures to produce either recursive processes or iterative processes.